Okay, again, welcome to the Assessed Initiative Assess Insights webinar uh, for April of 2021. Uh, the Assessed Initiative was formed to significantly impact and grow the use and benefit of engineering simulation software, including all types of engineering simulation software from 0D to 3D. This involves working with several thought leaders throughout the industry to help address the directions, issues, and strategies going forward for broader implementation of engineering software with the intent to also provide broader benefit to the users of engineering simulation. The ASSESS initiative stands for Analysis, Simulation, and Systems Engineering Software Strategies. We work with multiple different organizations like NAFEMS and INCOSI and Medelica to help move forward the whole industry related to using engineering simulation. ASSESS focuses on strategy and does not get into implementation details. We have, however, worked with people to highlight what implementation details may make sense in several different areas. Assess is broken into seven key themes related to uh, the advancement of engineering simulation. And those themes include democratization of engineering simulation, business challenges, align a government, alignment of government research and commercial activities, uh, simulation governance, generative design, engineering simulation digital twins, and integration of systems and detailed subsystem simulations. In these different areas, the topic of standards has come up in many of these, in governance, in, in business challenges, in integration, in doctor, doc, doc, democratization, and also obviously in the integration. So with that in mind, we've invited Hubertus Tumashite to give us a presentation about a new standard for connecting physical modeling and embedded software called the EFMI standard. Hubertus is the chief solutions officer for Modelon. He's also a board member for the Modelica Association and has been an active member of Modelica since its initiation. He's also on the advisory committee for the ASSESS initiative and has been an active member of the ASSESS initiative since its founding. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let you proceed, Hubertus. Okay, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Joe, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so this is really a very new standard, which is a little bit before its 1.0 release, uh, and it has been developed in a relatively large European project. So first, let me go into the structure of my talk. I'll start with the motivation. Why is this standard needed? You know, there are standards which are just collecting dust on bookshelves, and we hope this one will it not be. And <clears throat> also discuss a little bit why we need a new standard. Then I will look at how it actually works, and then present a few use cases and examples and the business value that this has. So let's start really with uh, early motivation on, on what this comes from. Why, why EFMI? Where, where does this whole idea come from that we need to connect models and embedded software? So in the, in the early 1970s, there came about uh, an insight that every good controller of any plant or any system needs to contain a model of that controller. There is actually interesting history behind that because all the research in at Lund University in Sweden that led to the foundation of a modeling association and this whole idea of building models for controls came out of this insight. Every good controller of a plan needs to contain a model of that controller. And these models can be used actually in various components, so complex controllers can contain several models of the same system for different purposes and slightly different types of models. So in order to look at this and really give something that some of you might have experienced, but I hope you haven't actually, is ESP, 
um, electronic stability program, I think, is the abbreviation for. This one is from Bosch, and Bosch has been one of the uh, founders of this initiative for the EFMI project. This is about active safety. So a car control system can actively react in a dangerous situation to stabilize the vehicle. There's a long link and so on. So let's look at really what they want to show us. Uh, I'm not sending through the sound, uh, but I'm rather going to tell you what this is about. So what we will see is a, a traffic situation where we will compare a car, the same car, the same situation, up to the point when the electronic stability program um, actually works. And then we'll see the differences in between. So if you have a modern vehicle with a complex controller and an ABS system, you can um, use these controllers to actively influence unsafe situations and try to stabilize the car. So the scene here is driving on a highway and a sudden obstacle shows up. So a car is going um, at moderate speeds on the highway and then suddenly the truck swings out and uh, the car loses control, turns around and yeah, stays there in the opposite direction uh, of the traffic. Not a funny situation. Um, and with ESP, the situation can actually be handled differently. So when the vehicle approaches and comes into a situation and the driver reacts, the controller can actually detect that the car starts to spin and break the single tires of the vehicle in such a way as to stabilize the vehicle to the intended trajectory. That requires actually a couple of of um, components in the model that, that help this whole control system. So first of all, it needs the, um, a virtual sensor to detect the vehicle state. You know, the controller needs to figure out when it becomes unstable and starts to spin. It can also use an inverse model of the vehicle dynamics in the actual controls when it applies the actuators on the wheel. So it usually breaks on specific wheels in order to stabilize the vehicle and in order to figure out how long, how much force and which wheels to apply, it needs a model of the vehicle. So now, as you can see, many modern cars have these. And uh, so this is state of the art technology. But today there's a lot of error prone manual work involved to get the models into the controls. And the purpose of EFMI is to make that simple. So it all starts with this internal model principle. You need a good model and a controller, and you want to make that good. Okay, enough of motivation now. Uh, let's move into how this all came about. Um, this new EFMI standard to bring physical models to ECU software, um, has been developed in an ITS 3 project that's a European IT industry um, government EU funded project that ran from 2018 to uh, 2021. It was, it finished about a month ago. And in order to um, not just have a temporary project, but keep that thing alive long-term, the EFMI standard is, has been transferred now to the Modelica Association just last month, month in March, so that um, it will have a continued home and it is possible to develop it further. This is actually a very similar way as to how the FMI standard came about. It was a large project. Um, many of these European projects are quite large, but this was even large for the European and ITEA projects. It's more than 100 person years went into this. Many companies from different countries were involved. And it was an interesting mix because it needed companies from the embedded world. It had companies that really came in from the user side and it had companies on the modeling and uh, modeling side with uh, Modelon, my company, also 
Siemens, das System, ESI, um, Maplesoft, so many companies on the, on the tool side of models, many companies on the tool side uh, of embedded systems, DSpace, uh, D ETAS, um, also service companies in, in that domain, etc. There also was an OEM advisory board with BMW, Daimler, Mazda, and Volvo being on the OEM advisory board because this is, has been mostly treated as an automotive problem. It is interesting to note though that EFMI, that they took a lot of care to make sure that this is not tied to automotive. It is very generically available. So let's look at what we are trying to do. We're trying to really bridge the gap between modeling and simulation, where we try to understand and take the temperature of the world and all kinds of systems in the world um, by simulation and uh, embedded software, where we try to put this knowledge of the world of these models into a product, into a final product. And Today, I would say these worlds are quite separate in terms of the tools, in terms of the know-hows, in terms of everything that makes a, a, a simple fluid workflow between the model and the workflow. So what do we want? We want physical models for embedded software. And we want to embed these uh, in a process model into a virtual sensor. And we need these models online. So they are um, a key technology for advanced control. Here, the example is engine control. It is used in virtual sensors. It is used for model-based diagnosis. It can be used as inverse physical models, as feed-forward parts of, of control structures and model predictive controls. Um, so the physical models are typically described by differential equations best suited for dynamics. It can also be combined with database modeling. Um, and what we really need is a reduced calibration effort compared to pure data models, because we understand the physics and have the physical parameters. What it sometimes can mean is that we want to reduce real sensors in order to do control functions. Good model can make it much simpler to have reduced sensing in order to really understand what the system is currently doing. So what's going to be new here? The state of the art is that the poor function developer that needs to do um, function development for ECU software needs to be a superhero because he needs to understand physical modeling or he or she, control engineering, with systems theory, stability, robustness, numerics in order to make these models run robustly. And they need to understand, in the end, ECU software, where they have to understand standards that you probably never have heard about, like MISRA, that is Motor Industry Safety and Reliability Association. They have standards on how automotive ECU software should look like. AutoSAR is also for uh, automotive ECUs. So these function developers need to understand all of this. And superheroes uh, are rare. So what do we want to achieve with a new standard? We want with the new standard to achieve new tools, tool chains, and new ways of collaboration, where we do not need a superhero anymore, but we can go with separate people that are fizzling, physical modeling experts control engineers, ECU software developers, and all the detailed knowledge about numerics, we actually want to um, store in libraries and numerical services so that nobody has to take care of that part as a human. And we want to give them the proper tools and ways to ask, uh, access the numerical services and libraries in order such that they can happily do their job and the superhero isn't needed anymore. So what are we trying to achieve here? We're, we want to do EFMI, so an FMI for embedded systems, where we have model-based systems engineering in the development process, where we have 
also from the modelic isolation, the FMI standard, the functional mockup unit, in order to be able to store models and share models and combine models in terms of the um, systems engineering and systems design process. Then we want to bring that into the world of software engineering with the CFMI standard, where we have a, an embedded model of the system that goes into the software. Um, where all these parts actually <clears throat> can be combined with runtime environments that are real time, for example, in the case of automotive autosar. Now, we make really sure that this EFMI standard does work with autosar, but it's not in any way connected or dependent. It can work on any type of um, embedded control structure and for other industries, even when it is not automotive. Um, so, and in the end, we want this code to really end up in the product. So things which originate at desktops of um, modeling engineers and control engineers end up um, through a direct transformation and tool chain in the controller. So how does this work? Um, you from I really try to build this up um, based on a workflow where we start with a physical model. Um, then that physical model flows into controller models and can flow into it in, in several different positions, basically. Um, and then we have this EFMI standard and several data formats based on it. And from the controller model, so we have, let's say, the model in the loop step of, of design, it then moves to production code. And that production code can then be compiled into an application that runs on an electronic control unit on a car, combined with AutoSAR to ECU software. And then we have an ECU application. And so this standard is designed around this workflow. So let me try to start with this workflow, the different representations that EFMI standardizes and the enable tool chain where green is the modeling world, blue is the embedded world, and the striped thingies are ones which are an overlap in both different domains. So we typically start with models. Um, they can be a-causal or causal tools, um, working with differential algebraic equations or ordinary differential equations. They are the models. They can come from Modelica, Simulink, SIG is a, is a modeling tool in the automotive industry. And here we have the physical model. We have models of controllers, maybe estimators that are needed there. We have diagnostic systems. We might have neural networks um, and any combination of these. Typically, the starting point of this model is a causal. Then one way of uh, capturing what we have at the model and the intent of the designer is that we simulate the models. And what we can get out of that is really a bridge between the modeling and the embedded world. We get a behavioral model of the AFMB. And the behavioral model are just reference results. So you have different sets of inputs that give different sets of outputs such that I have a definition, a start definition of what I expect my model to do and to generate. This is very useful later in the process, as we will see. The next thing that we may want to do with a model is that we want to transform the model into something that can go into a controller in a safe form. So there's a transformation where we have inputs and outputs maybe an integrator that was used to, to integrate the model in time, and interfaces of service functions. And what we want to do with this transformation, we want, we'll find, want to find a causal upper bounded in terms of both time and memory footprint solution algorithm that can solve this model such that it can be put into uh, um, a controller. So, and what we have there is the next part of the EFMU standard. It's called algorithm code. 
where I have an algorithmic representation of this equation-based model. I think this part is probably the main real innovation of the EFEU standard. Um, they invented a completely new language called Gaelic, and Gaelic stands for Guarded Algorithmic Language for Embedded Control, which is uh, target-independent, algorithmic, so it's causalized, it's not equations anymore, and it's in the, an intermediate language for sample data systems. So why was this intermediate format chosen? Well, this is something that the modeling world knows and understands and can generate. And the next step in the tool chain is something that typically only the embedded world and tools in the embedded world can do. So let's go further here. Then this algorithm code can be taken by companies which are specialists in compilers for embedded control software and um, and ECUs. And so this algorithm code is then transformed into production code, also as part of the EFMU standard. That's this production C code, um, and it can have an FMI for co-simulation of wrap for example. And it can have be generic or has a specific target configuration. It can have then different thickness of things. Um, and you can embed uh, coding standards and coding rules, which may be industry specific. So, for example, there are coding guidelines by this uh, MISRA organization that were used to check that the production code that came out of this tool chain actually fulfilled its requirements. Um, the behavioral model can now be reused again to validate that the production code that was generated um, actually generates the same results as the original model did and that things didn't didn't go wrong so we can verify this c code and we can also use the production code for software in the loop simulation because now we have the controller as it's supposed to be we can combine that again with the original model and check whether things still work as they are supposed to be then there is a last step of transformation to binary code um, for the EFMU, which may be linked with service functions compiled and integrated so that from the production code, um, you get something that can be executed in a target environment on an ECU or a real-time PC in rapid prototyping systems, AutoSAR or anything similar. So I would say that this, this slide and this workflow really explains the core of what the EFMU standard does. So EFMU does actually standardize these four different representations of basically the same thing. We have a behavioral model of the original model, which is mostly reference results and trajectories that we can use to verify and validate that the, the, all these transformation steps don't change the basic behavior of the model. We have the algorithm code, which makes it possible to really separate the worlds of know-how of the embedded world and the modeling world as an intermediate language that is independent and can then be reused and transformed. And then we have um, the parts which are purely in the embedded world. We have production code that can be compiled and transformed into binary code that then really runs on the final application. So now let's look at how this may be packaged and how this relates to FMI, FMU, and the container structure. I mean, if you understand FMI or have known anything about it, you might know that it is a container for um, a model and a model description meta information about you know, what the model is about, how it can be parameterized. So, EFMI actually decided that you can have the EFMU, which is the, um, the unit, the code unit that contains these different representations, have it independent, or you can have it actually embedded in a classic co-simulation FMU, um, which is this outer gray structure. So we have inside the EFMU root, we have an EFMU manifest 
the manifest will tell you what's in it. So it will tell you whether there are reference results out of the code. And there can be several different versions of production code for different targets, uh, as well as binary codes. Each of these representations, again, has its own manifest explaining what's in it. It's basically the metadata, the information about what it contains. And then the behavioral model has very simple CSV files with reference trajectories. The algorithm code has a manifest and the garlic code, the garlic algorithm language for embedded controls. And the production code has then plain a manifest and plain C code. Binaries have a manifest and object code for a specific target platform. Okay, so what are the special requirements for the modish embedded systems? We have uh, specialized hardware microcontrollers with limited data memory and code memory and static memory allocation. Often they are single position due to restricted data types, fixed point, floating point. Then we have special um, high safety requirements on the software. There can be special coding guidelines. They are different from industry to industry. What was used mostly in EFMI really is the MISRA rules, the Motor Industry Software Reliability Association. They have code rules <clears throat> on how to write code. So you have, for example, in numerical software, you have exception handling for not a number and division by zero. And within this tool chain, that is not anymore available on on these platforms. So we need to make sure that these things cannot happen and are guarded against. That's what the garlic language is for. You have also inbound guarantees on, on what kind of inputs uh, are allowed. And then, of course, you have hard real-time requirements on cyclic tasks. You have really guaranteed execution times and uh, limit the smallest possible sampling rate. In automotive, it can be a millisecond. For other systems, it could be much larger. You have special operate, real-time operating systems and specialized tools and tool chains. And so what this is about really is providing the tools in order to um, yeah, drill down and get the model really onto the ECU. Okay, um, there have been a number of um, demonstrators in order to show that this actually works. Um, so let's look at what the project did. Now I have, unfortunately, I have slightly bad news here. There have been a number of really interesting and cool examples among the demonstrators, which I unfortunately am not allowed to tell because they are guarded by project specific NDAs. So that is interesting information about very interesting demonstrators that have been done that I cannot um, talk, do details about. So this is only the public information. Um, interesting is maybe that the partners in the project considered this really to be sensitive competitive information because they see huge value in this. So let's look at how these demonstrators work, um, or which demonstrators were done. There was actually done a lot of work in order to make sure that this quite ambitious uh, tool chain actually works. So Siemens, Dana did a demonstrator automotive, a hybrid engine talk prediction using a, um, a scale model neural network. So they transformed a much more complex model into a neural network to use that in the controller. DLR, that's the German Aerospace Research Institute, they used a semi-active damping controller with a nonlinear inverse model and nonlinear Kalman filtering. Gipsa Lab used a vehicle dynamics control by a parentized nonlinear model predictive control for a semi-active control with also with neural networks. So here it was put, you, you can see some sort of race type vehicle uh, on a four poster test stand where you, uh, it, it was tested, the controller was actually tested in that situation. So the, the final controllers, uh, the final demonstrators actually often showed driving cars with the embedded controllers in them from this project. 
Renault had a demonstrator with a Kalman filter for air filtering. Daimler had a demonstrator with a dual clutch transmission diagnosis. So this is a slightly different use case of diagnostics, model-based diagnostics. Volvo built a demonstrator with a transmission model as a virtual sensor to actually understand what the um, model did. Uh, Dassault system had a demonstrator with an advanced emergency braking system controller. Um, so similar to what we saw in the introduction. Bosch had several use cases with a powertrain vibration reduction controller and model-based diagnosis of a thermal system. And then um, Bosch also did a lot of work on EFMI performance assessment. So does it actually work? Um, does it have a small footprint memory-wise? Does it work with saturated IOs, etc.? So um, the difficulty of this performance assessment was from low to medium to high, and it used very simple models to more complex systems, uh, reduced order models even with high dimensional maps, and reduced order models that could even contain um, finite elements or um, CFD, but in reduced order form. Uh, and also a rectifier for electric vehicle. So uh, there was done, a lot of work was done on this. So let's look a little bit more into these um, verification and validation efforts. Um, in order to make sure that the whole tool chain works, um, a library build was, was built in Modelica of emphasis test cases. Um, that is probably the most extensive test library, but also other sources were used because EFMI was again taken care of to be not um, exclusively for Modelica. Um, so AIMS and models were used, which are basically C code written according to very specific conventions and to manually written garlic codes were used to test um, uh, the tool chain. And then there's this library with 22 test cases and 43 variants. Then testing was really set up to cover a large range of typical and challenging examples with explicit and implicit integration schemes, different types of models, inverse models, feedback mineralizations, event-based reinitializations of continuous states. Um, this garlic language needs certain built-in functions to work, like solving linear systems of equations and data interpolation and so on. So in total, more than 500 test scenarios were <clears throat> built up, covering the complete tool chain to be executed from the very beginning in the modeling world down to getting the code actually into a vehicle and testing it. Um, okay, so um, one example here of things that, that need to be tested, which are interesting is, for example, division by zero could be trivial. If you happen to know anything about uh, ABS control and how to control tire slip, which was is part of the more complex EPS system, you will realize that um, you need to know the slip and you actually need to divide by the velocity of the vehicle. Well, once you finish braking, the velocity is zero. So there you have the opportunity for a numerical hiccup this was one typical case that was tested here in these test examples. And in the same way, a fairly complex test suite was built up to make sure this works. There was also an EFMI compliance checker implemented, which is open source, and <clears throat> that is meant to help companies that want to implement this in the future to figure out whether um, they've done that properly. So uh, actually here, this test case with SNP with safe division was one of these <clears throat> particular test cases. So how does this whole tool chain perform? So if you think about it um, today, if you have these models and controllers, they're usually handwritten and hand optimized um, in the past. And you need to figure out um, also that the memory footprint is okay, that static memory allocation works, that error handling works, meaning that these things even work when some hardware components are broken and you get faulty sensor inputs, et cetera. So 
how does this all work? Um, and you need to validate that the maximum, maximum execution time helps. Um, the detailed results of these performance tests are project confidential and often tool specific and <clears throat> confidential for the tool. But the general results are that actually everybody was very happy with the project results. The memory footprint of all tests was good and comparable to hand optimized codes. Interesting was that many examples ran actually faster than hand optimized code. So setting up this well thought out tool chains where every step could have was done by specialists in their own domain actually made it possible to make this better than the old way of manually optimized codes by or by human intelligence optimized codes. Some few examples were slower, but I think the maximum slower was 30%. And we have to take into account that all tools in this tool chain are still early prototypes. So where is the business value here? Well, um, <clears throat> one of the main challenges in the field of automotive embedded systems is really um, software complexity. What you see here on the left is um, a way how Bosch tried to uh, visualize software complexity for a complex embedded software system where the area is proportional or is equivalent to the lines of code and the color um, gives you something that they call the BMI, the Bosch Maintainability Index on how difficult it is to maintain this particular piece of software. You can see that there are large enough areas of red code that is hard to maintain. And what you want to achieve with the FMI is really to make this much more maintainable because this code wasn't even handwritten or some of this code, but it was really <clears throat> automatically generated. So the benefits of lower software complexity are obvious. You have less maintenance effort, less calibration effort, and even less ECU resource demand. So there is a big need for this complexity reduction. There's also a need for functional innovation. Controls get ever more complex. I mean, the um, autonomous vehicles at the moment is really one of the things that um, <clears throat> will drive complexity of controllers. Again, a large step up. You can also see here the plot of average number of ECUs per cars. Uh, this plot ends actually three years ago in 2018. And for luxury vehicles, it was over 50 ECUs. Now, these are all small ECUs. Actually, <clears throat> Tesla, for example, has a different strategy with um, much more complex, much bigger ECUs, but um, they still need exactly the same amount of software in these fewer ECUs, and the software complexity is uh, also continuously increasing at the same. So EFMI is mostly about this software complexity. So what's the, what's the business impact here? We have we want to increase the productivity and really be able to reuse model libraries and numerical service functions that come from the model-based design and model-based systems engineering world and introduce automation for model translation and code generation and a seamless tool chain where we really get, remove the barrier <clears throat> between the physical modeling world and um, the ECU software development and have a continuous tool chain from the physical model to a da data flow representation uh, where we can then put these things into production into a real um, vehicle. On the software side, they really want to master complexity and software design um, with abstraction and encapsulation and be able to separate the concerns between the physical behavior, data flow, and embedded code. For tool vendors, <clears throat> that is also very interesting because um, they can really expand the market in the model-based design domain. Suppliers and OEMs have large advantages because they can introduce new advanced functions for vehicles faster and in some cases replace hardware with software. This will also introduce new modes of co collaboration. 
So now let's at the end look a little bit at the voice of the customer. What have the OEM that were not part of the actual project, but um, basically evaluating it said. So uh, <clears throat> these are um, actual quotes from members of the advisory committee. So we're using the same universal and physical plan model as EF and U in MIL, SIL, HIL. This is model in the loop, software in the loop, hardware in the loop, and on the issue is a technological breakthrough with considerable potential to reduce the development time. Then from uh, Volvo, which is two different companies these days, Volvo Cars and Volvo Trucks, what we demonstrated using EFMI for the model-based development of a virtual sensor is the way to do it. That's a typical Swedish understatement way. EFMI is a very systematic and portable approach to model-based development of automotive embedded software. That's from Volvo Trucks. And uh, from JSAE, that's a Japanese version of the Society of Automotive Engineers, Yutaka Hirano. EFMI will revolutionize the translation of models to embedded software. So the, the OEM that accompanied the model were actually quite happy. So how is the future governance of the EFMI standard. It has become a modelic association project, which is open to everybody. Project bylaws require that the standard is open, so the Creative Commons for the text and a BSD3 course license for software artifacts. Um, there is a future project website, EFMI-standard.org. Now, uh, <clears throat> that one is not quite active yet. That will all the standard once the formation of the year for my project is progressing a little bit more. Now, what I would like to uh, point out here is that EFMI is not only from <clears throat> Modelica, it can really be used with all kinds of other different uh, source formats. Garlic, this new language is an open intermediate representation that's opening EFMI for other modeling languages. And these um, automatized production code testing, AutoZAR, platform integration, etc. It, it goes into a much um, broader group than just the Modelica source as a modeling language. So let me come to the summary then. Um, what we have with EFMI is a new standard to bridge the gap between physical modeling and embedded software. It started as an ITR3 project and the maintenance is continued in the Modelic Association. It's approaching a 1.0 release, which is public on GitHub. Um, there is a, a website, emphasis.github.io, for the project results, where we have <clears throat> the alpha version of the standard is published. Um, what is interesting with this European project is that it really gives you out of the gate support from two vendors both on the modeling and the embedded software side. I think most of these tools have reached prototype status. Um, I think few of them are really ready now um, for the full commercial release, but the commercial releases are planned for this and the next year. Now keep in mind that this standard is not even released in the 1.0 version, um, but it will be probably within the month, month of April. There is support and demand from automotive OEM and suppliers. And yeah, it will be continued maintenance and support as a new product, which was started in March. And if you are really interested in the technical details, there will be in-depth papers and presentations at the Modelica Conference 2021, which is going to be an online conference, September 20 to 22, 20. Oh, of this year, 25. Okay, that was it for the presentation. Thanks a lot. And um, we are now open to questions.